I'd like to first of all say that um, Denmark has had a tremendous impact on my uh, work and career um, in many different ways. Uh, first, I would say through his own work. I mean, he's done all this tremendous work. And uh, I remember as a student, I was studying all these fascinating theorems. Great pleasure. Uh, I was actually a student in Aarhus, uh, Denmark, and I was kind of isolated. I was among, surrounded by topologists, but I found out that I liked John Schreiber. So I tore through uh, the famous uh, DKM, Oberon Klingenberg Meyer, Riemann Stück Geometrie in Morsen. And if you see my lecture notes, you can't tell where the, uh, what, is, what is front and what is back. I mean, the, the binding is completely gone. It's loose pages all over the place. And, uh, but what I did most of that time was actually, I, I was interested in the closed geodesics uh, problem. And I looked, I studied all of Klingenberg's work. I studied the fantastic theorem of, of Rommel and Meyer. And I, I, I wasn't able to do anything myself. So I, I, so I guess this was a sign that I might become a mathematician, so I sort of chose to change it a little bit, and I, I started to investigate the more general case of isometry in the geodesics. And so I think it was, uh, I had just gotten my master's degree, and that's when I met them for the first time. So my advisor's advisor, uh, Jim Eels, introduced me to Detlef at an Arbeitstagung in Bonn, and so I got to tell Detlef a little bit about what I've been thinking about. And he was extremely supportive, and that was very helpful to me at the time. Um, I then went to Bonn for a couple of years, and uh, it was an exciting time. I remember we studied in a, in a, in a so-called Arbeitsgemeinschaft. Well, Ben Zillow remember it too. He was there. We went through the Soul Theorem, and I'd never seen anything as pretty. And, um, and then at another Arbeitstagung, I'm sitting there like this little little guy and, and listening at lunch. And uh, Detlef and, and Wolfgang Meyer were having lunch with a group of people that I happened to be there. That they were talking about Hitzebo and explaining the exotic sphere that they had just discovered. This uh, one of the Milner spheres could be represented that way and not make a recurrence. It was a very exciting time. Um, at that point, I'd never imagined. That I would uh, that I would actually end up working with that lift. It was a terrific experience. I spent the year 77, 78 here, and uh, so that's where we started uh, collaborating. And um, but I would say that even uh, as 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 great as that uh, was for me, and we both enjoyed it, I'm sure. Um, maybe even more importantly, uh, both of our families got became friendly with one another. And uh, uh, I still had a hard time. Said, 
And so Rolf and Zilla had just discovered these metrics of non-negative curves on the middle spheres. So he said, what about manifolds of non-negative curvature, the quest for examples? Okay. So I thought that was good. So I decided to honor Deadlift and continue this line and uh, talk about the quest for manifolds of positive curvature. But I can't do that without talking about non-negative curvature as well. So let's let P be the manifolds of positive curvature and P0 the manifolds of non-negative curvature. And when I say curvature in this talk, I mean sectional curvature. Right? So, so first of all, uh, and I, I could have added something to the title actually, the quest for examples, I should have added and obstructions because there is certainly a need like nothing else for that as well. And that will be apparent. So I'll just talk about the, uh, the theorems that we know, the general theorems that we know that are non-negative curves. Huh? And first of all, there's the solar curve. As we heard about it by Blaine. So it simply states that a non-compact manifold complete of non-negative curvature is a bundle over a compact one. So that's a logical conclusion of it. And this will actually play um, a role in my talk. I will talk about the Sol theorem for compact manifolds as strange as it sounds, but you will see how that comes out. So then there's the, the, the Bedinov theorem. So this is Shaker Cobol in general, and the first joint with the Maya in the positive case. Then there's a very number theorem. The Rebola, which asserts that um, in any given dimension, so there exists a constant which only depends on the dimension, such that the homology of the manifold is uh, generated by the most CN elements. Okay. I, I'd like to say actually, the year that, we, that I visited here, uh, we worked on, on these uh, the, the, the manifolds with diameter half maximal, but we also actually tried to think about this without knowing that, uh, that Misha was working on this. Now we never got close to it. So, so the, the, the third obstruction is for spin manifolds. And it was also mentioned earlier today. So for a spin manifold, the, uh, this work due to uh, Hitch and, and uh, Nirovich says that the A roof, or generalized A roof, must be managed. So, so these are really the uh, obstructions uh, that are known to non-negative curves. Now, if you pass on to positive curves, huh, the, 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 the sad thing is that you don't add any more obstructions uh, except uh, obstructions on the fundamental group, so far, right? And the, the obvious one is that, uh, <coughs> so if you have a compact manifold, then the fundamental group is finite, and the only difference in non-negative curves uh, that is that you know how it differs from being finite. And this all comes from the splitting theorem. Well, I'm talking about from this setting, but otherwise, uh, I would Jeff and Patrick. So, um, now, on the other hand, one would expect, so for example, so is there a difference in the simple connected case between these two classes? And everybody would say that there the must be, but no one has all the instructions yet. This also suggests that maybe there are actually many examples known in this class as compared to this one, and maybe some of these guys could be deformed to have a metric positive curve. Right? But that's a very delicate problem. So why do we know many more? It's basically due to the known constructions. So what are the known constructions of manifolds of these types? So uh, the simplest maybe even the most important one in the non-negative curvature case is, of course, that if you have two manifolds 
If it's zero, then they're product. product method, and you have one with non-negative curves. And to this day, it's not even known, it's not a single product manifold known that emits symmetrical positive curves. Okay? So not just the old hot problem, mm -hmm. but in general. So, now the other main uh, uh, piece of construction is to take quotients. So, if, you, if, uh, if pi is a Riemannian subversion, then it is known that the curvatures are only increasing. So if you start with something that has non-negative curvatures, of course, you get something non-negative curvatures. And sometimes you can show that you get positive curvature. And up until recently, this was all, all known ways of finding examples with positive curvatures. Now the main source for all of these constructions of course, is you need to start with something that has non-negative curvature, huh? and the key source are compact Lie groups. Okay? So you start with G, a compact Lie group, and um, you take portions of it, and you get spaces of non-negative curvature. So, with, so this is with the binary metric. As Blaine also mentioned, so any sets compact Lie group has uh, non-negative curves. So, for example, all homogeneous spaces have metrics of non-negative curves. Huh? Ah, okay, that could be fun. The <laughs> change in the... Okay, so all of these have... Now, there's an important extension of this. These are called bi quotients. And you get those by thinking about the fact that g acts on itself, g cross g acts from left and right. So here you can have g, the h contained in g cross g, uh, g acting on, on g in the usual way from left and right. So g1, g2 times g is g1, g2, oops, g1, g, is the inverse. Right? So you have this isometric action. So if you take a subgroup and look at the restriction of this action, of course you, you get a quotient space, and that's denoted like this. And if this group acts freely, then you have a manifold of non-negative curves. Right? So as a matter of fact, uh, this was pioneered by uh, by Detlef and Wolfgang uh, Meyer, uh, exactly in this situation. You take sp2 and a certain subgroup, uh, sp1 subgroup of sp2 cross sp2, so that this is one of these on middle spheres. And since then, uh, Eschenburg and the Zeichen have constructed infinite families of bi quotients with positive curves. Okay. Now, in addition to uh, in addition to these. Uh, Constructions here, I should add over here the special gluings. Can you say what the definition of G equals times H is? Yes, so uh, that's what I tried to explain here. So if H is a subgroup of G cross G, it acts on G as a subaction of G cross G on itself. But G acts on the left and the right, right, in, in this way. Oh. So if you take a subgroup, you get an action of G. And the quotient, this one I denote by G double slash H, okay? And it's called a, a bi quotient because H kind of acts on two sides. So it's not a homogeneous space, not even up to whole function, typically. Okay? So, so, so this provides a large class of spaces, non negative curvature, and even many with positive curvature. Yeah, this is one of the total rank. Uh, yes, in all these examples, yes. Right. I could talk about injectors also, but I, I won't. Uh, okay. Now, the special gluings, the first two are cheaper. Can everyone see down here, by the way, in the back? Okay. 
Uh, if you take a, so let me just abbreviate it. A cross, I mean a compact rank one symmetric space. I will use it again. So spheres, projective spaces with their standard metrics, complex and periodic Cayley plane. So Jeff shows that if you take the connected sum of any two of them, of course it's the same sense, and put a metric of non-negative curves, curves. It actually came from the soul theory, forming fibers of, of the uh, projective spaces of lower dimension. Okay? So, um, and then a few years ago, Bob Pinsilla and I showed that uh, many cohorts need to one manage goals that also have a structure that are union of two disk bundles, have metrics of non-negative curvature, and as a matter of fact, as, as long as the code are mixed with the singular orbits is at those two. Okay? Uh, I will not talk about this now, but I'll get into complete later on and I'll explain. Maybe uh, I should tie my shoes. <laughs> independent of that core. <laughs> okay. So, um, so let me move on. We have a lot of examples. We have a lot of oh yeah, yeah. Actually, of, 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 uh, of non-negative curves, so there are lots of examples. Okay. And uh, so now let me move on. And uh, so first of all, uh, Blaine already explained. So so you you go back go back to this case. Is there a difference? And of course, one of the most spectacular examples to look at would be this Romolaya sphere. So you take this I quotient, it's a particular quotient of uh, SP2, that is an exotic sphere, and uh, there's this long manuscript due to Peterson and Wilhelm, in which they claim to uh, have constructed a metric of the positive curves, which is truly spectacular. And, uh, it also, of course, makes all previous uh, diffeomorphism theorems worthwhile, right? Uh, I mean, a lot of us proved diffeomorphism theorems for manifolds of positive curvature. Well, if there were no exotic spheres with positive curvature, they kind of go out the window. So it's very, uh, I mean, this is very exciting. Uh, but it is extremely difficult. So this is actually the first instance of, of uh, deforming metrics of non-negative curves of the positive curves. Right? So um, the method I'll talk about has to do with symmetries. So it is uh, sort of guided by the following principle. So classify manifolds with positive curvature and large isometric groups. The same goes for uh, negative, of course. And uh, of course, you can be more modest also. You could say, describe the structure of positively curved manifolds that admit the large group of isometries, right? And large, of course, has to do with relative to the size of the manifold somehow, right? Either in terms of dimension of the group or, or whatever else you can think of as being large. So, uh, so in a certain sense, this is a way, this is, in a certain sense, I think of this as a way, as a pinching condition, but in terms of pinching of symmetries rather than a curvature or size or anything else. So the sphere, as you all know, has the largest isometry group period of all manifolds in terms of dimension, relative to dimension of the manifold, and that's, uh, that's an extreme case. It, it characterizes the sphere. And um, so you, you loosen up what you mean by large, and, and that's like a, a pinching condition. And all you say is the manifold has positive curves of the large isometry group. What can you say? Okay. And by now there are lots of theorems. And uh, so let me just, I just want to mention one. So let me mention the following theorem. So it says, um, so let's say, uh, Take an n manifold with positive curvature of cohomogeneity k. So what does that mean? So the isometry group 
x on this manifold and the orbit space has dimension k. Okay, so by, by this I mean at least some group of isomers is x, so that the orbit space has dimension k. Okay, so this is the co-dimension of the principal orbit is k. Okay. So you fix k and you look at the manifold of positive curves of O to meet k. And the statement is that M <coughs> is special if the dimension is big. Okay? So M is, is a cross up to some equivalence when N is at least um, uh, 18 times 1 plus K squared and k is at least 1. Okay? And so this is, is up to 10 denser homotopy equivalents. Okay, so, so Wilkins theorem says that M has the same 10 denser homotopy type as a compact ray, one symmetric space, if N has large dimensions compared to the coordinate. Okay? So this is a this is a spectacular theorem in my mind. Um, this number has to do with this number holds only if I take k at least one. If you take k equal to zero, it's no because all homogeneous manifolds of positive curves have been classified, and they exist only in dimensions other than the crosses. They exist only in dimensions six, seven. 12, 13, and 24. Okay? So we can write 25 in this case. And you can see that this doesn't go all right? So this is still a fairly uh, small number. So when when uh, Walker proved this theorem, I was both uh, disappointed and excited. I was disappointed because Bob and Zilla and I was dreaming about constructing cohomes need to one manifolds in infinitely many dimensions. Well, this just kills that, of course. There's no way we're going to do that. But then I got excited because it means that now it's realistic to think about the problem because we only have to check finding many dimensions. Okay? So let's think about k equals 1. So what does that mean? That means that we had a group G that acts on M so that the orbit space is one dimension. Okay? So it's either a circle or an interval. Now, if M is simply connected, it's very easy to see that it must be an interval. And I'm assuming M has positive curvature, so it has finite fundamental group, and I might as well think about the simply connected case. Okay? So this is, I assume, this is an interval. So, um, so this is this is the situation. The principal orbit is the co-dimension one manifold, and then you have two orbits that correspond to the endpoints of the interval. Okay? And these have uh, not principal isotropes. And actually, when M is simply connected, they must be single. They have strictly smaller dimensions. Okay? So at least co-dimension two. This one has co-dimension one. And if you organize, if you take an invariant metric and take a shortest geodesic from one single orbit to the other single orbit, and you label the isotropic group here as k minus, and the isotropic group here as k plus, and all points on this geodesic have the same isotropic group that I will label with h, then um, you have the following special situation. So first of all, this orbit over here is t one minus, and this orbit is t one k plus, and of course the principal orbit is t one h. So you have this one parameter family of coordinates in one manifold that collapse to these lower dimensional manifolds, and m. This is m. So m is a union of the tubular neighborhood of this one with the tubular neighborhood of that one. Right. So m is a tubular neighborhood. G mod k minus and G mod k plus. Moreover, 
if you look at the normal phase to this point, then k minus x transitive on the normal sphere, that I'll call s per minus. So uh, in other words, s per minus is um, k minus log h. And similarly, the normal sphere at this point, s per plus, is a plus divided by h. Okay? Now, the groups that act transitive on the spheres are all well known, right? And they must act linear. So this means if I know k and h, I know the sphere, so I know the disk. Okay? And by the slice theorem, I know what this tubular network looks like. So this is, in this case, by the slice theorem, the same as g cross, cross the normal disk divided out by k minus, doing them, g cross the normal disk divided out by k plus. In other words, I can recover the manifold from the isotropic group. So we have these isotropic groups, h, sitting inside k minus, sitting inside k plus, sitting inside p, like that. But these quotients are spheres. that completely defines the form of the one manifold. Okay? So if you want to classify cohorts in each one manifold with positive curvature, you're going to end up with a list of groups, H, K minus, K plus, and G, that tells you what the manifold is. Okay? Now Blaine, more than anyone, now I should say I should add Wu Yishan to it, because Wu Yishan and Blaine classified all the linear one axis. So on spheres, there are tons of them. Okay? And so this means there are lots and lots of diagrams that all need the sphere. So you need to have tools that simplify matters to go through in that way. Okay? Now, the uh, upshot of all this is that, uh, so what is this number for k equals 1? k equals 1, this is 72. Okay. So it's 72. Um, and there's a theorem. It turns out when you analyze it closely, you can lock that. Okay, so uh, well, first of all, in even dimensions, you have the only proof the following that if uh, M is positive in the curve, even dimension, cohorts need to one, then M plus. Period. The good action, as you know. Okay? It's actually up to equivariant different one. You cannot ask for more. This is the best classification we can have. Now this fails in odd dimensions because there are many Essenborg spaces, there are many Bazeikin spaces, there are three homogeneous spaces, three exactly, among the infinitely many we know. Three of them, other than the crosses, also have cohorts in each one axis. So it fails in, in odd dimensions. So what you can prove in odd dimensions is joint work with uh, Milton and Scylla. So the short version of the theorem says the following. If you take an odd dimensional manifold of positive curves of a pole into one, then uh, M is either a sphere, so let's take simply connected. M is uh, M equals Sn, or, and this is the with a linear action, or um, the dimension of M, so I'll give you the short version first. The dimension of M is 7, or well, I mean, a lot better than 72, <laughs> particularly, right? In dimension 7, we have a complete classification. We go over this, and it's complete. In dimension 7, there are... So you said 7, you mean 13? I said 7? Okay, sorry. I meant 13. Here we have, this is a classification. Whatever it is, it's a family of design expenses. So these are the only ones, they have positive curves, and they're the only ones that can have positive curves. In cohorts, these are what? Right, right. 
Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. All right? In the Benson 7, there are these two uh, homogeneous examples. There's one found by Berger and one found by Allah and Wallach. Uh, and, uh, and then there's inf an infinite family of acid water factors with these bicrotions, all of which have positive curves. In addition to those, we saw that potentially, so here, candidates, additional candidates, I'll just give them labels. So one seven dimensional exceptional manifold, an infinite family of one type, and another infinite family of another type. Okay? So these are infinite. So K equals one infinity in, in these cases. And what I mean by this is so so when you think about this uh, description here, so assuming you have positive curvature. You use the geometry to describe what conditions you have, and you end up that there are certain diagrams that you don't see anywhere else, and these diagrams correspond to some way. That's a short way of saying it. Um, it was it possibly a finite dimensional 13? Or? It's infinite. There are infinitely many dimensions of 13. There's an infinite subfamily of Bazaikin spaces. In dimension 13. In dimension 13. There's also an infinite family of decimal space in dimension 7. Okay? But in addition to that, there are two other infinite families that potentially are possible curves. I actually meant to say something else. What is this? It's four, I have to 4.30, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got carried away here. I didn't stick to my plan. But this is... Uh, so, so maybe let me... Uh, since I'm at this point, let me just tell you that P1 is a seven sphere. Okay? Standard seven sphere with standard action of SO4. Q1 is one is our fault space for that action. And the theorem, I'll put it here and then talk about it later. And the theorem says that uh, P2. Um, so this this is this was first uh, a, a metric with positive curvature, and the proof that this has positive curvature was first uh, proposed by Derrickard, who was a student of, of Netlabs, and uh, and uh, also a completely different approach is due to myself, uh, Gianni, and so. And at the end, I'll say a little bit about uh, our approach. Uh, before I forget it, though, I'd like to say that this is an interesting manifold. This is a new manifold for positive curvature because um, it is too connected. Okay, so so uh, pi two is trivial, and uh, there's only two known manifolds that are too connected, and that's the seven sphere and this Cauchy example. The J example has pi to 3 equal to C110. This one has, uh, has pi, pi 3 equal to C12. And as a matter of fact, it has the same cohomology as the unit tangent bundle over S4. You do not know if it's different one to the unit tangent bundle over S4. So this one is like the unit tangent bundle over S4 up to homomorphism. Mm -hmm. It's, it's natural, of course, to would like to conjecture that all these are possible curves. This would be uh, very interesting, in particular for this family, because they're all open. One G two. Yes. Right. It's a, it's a homology. It's a real homology. Right. It's, it's all yeah. trivial. Uh, H three is C log two, and right. that's it. The rest take care of that by the way well. So these families are the compatible with trauma. Yes. Now so why why so okay, so let, let me get back to this. So what is interesting about this? They are too connected. And there's a finiteness theorem due to Fang Rao on one side 
and, uh, and petroleum push button on the other side that shows in particular that if you take pinched manifolds of positive currents. So between two powers, two positive powers that are two connected, then you only have five in there. Okay? So this doesn't contradict that these are positive currents. And it would show that you can they just have the pins. So I, I promised in the beginning that I'll talk about the Sol theorem in uh, positive currents huh? and compact manifolds. So let me just uh, get back to this because it has to do with some of the structure that you deal with when you try to study this problem. Coal to to one is somewhat special because the orbit space is one dimensional. But if you have a group that is so big that the orbit space is one dimensional, you can also look at lots of other orbit spaces. You can take any subgroup of G and look at that orbit space. And you get interesting spaces. Okay? So that's part of the investigation. In general, if you have an isometric group action or a manifold, and you look at the orbit space, then this space has very nice structure, very nice geometric structure. It's a so-called Alexander space. <coughs> so if the section curvature of M is bounded below by some number K, then the corresponding curvature here of this space, I call this X, is greater than A in distance comparison sense. So we're not going to find the depth. And uh, of course, you have the map from M to the orbit space that takes a point to the orbit. The metric here is just the metric the distance between orbits. It's a length metric. It's a finite dimensional space. And this map is a so-called submetric. It generalizes submersions. And this is not a manifold. It doesn't make sense to say it's a submersion. But it's a submetric, meaning it takes all the radius R centered at any point onto the corresponding bar ball in the text. It's a notion into Aristotle. And such things preserve curves. And that's why you need all the curves. Now, I'd like to say a little bit about the structure of such spaces, because in particular, when M has positive curvature, then in the, stand, in the typical case, this space has positive so, I'll just write it. The boundary of this space is not empty if M has positive curves. Now, okay, this is in the sense of Alexandro space. This is not completely true, of course. You can, if you think of the three sphere and you divide out the half axon, you get the two sphere. Okay? There's no half. But this is an unusual example. As a matter of fact, all it takes, and that's just a special case. So, for example, if the principal isotropic group is non-trivial, then it implies that the bound is not empty. This is also this is an observation to work. Okay? So all it takes. So it's very exceptional that you don't have bound. Okay? Positive dimension. Pardon me? Positive dimension. No, non-trivial. I think non-trivial is all it takes. These portions don't have What do you mean? There's boundary all those. Why do I three? Who in that space? You have things in the five pair. Because 
of, of the beauty and, and the relationship to the soul theory. If you look at the uh, these uh, points in this space, and this space at any point, this orbit space, has a tangent space of some kind. Okay? So what is the tangent space at a, at, at a point in the orbit space? Well, it is really the normal sphere to the orbit divided out by oops, the normal space, sorry. TP, normal space to the orbit divided out by the isotope. Right? So here's, here's the point P, here's the orbit GP. If you look at the normal space to the orbit, and on the normal space, you have the action of the isotropic group. Okay? And it's quite reasonable. Everyone would accept this, of course, that in the orbit space, when, you, when the orbit becomes a point, the directions that are left are the ones that are just identified by the action of the isotropic group. Okay? So, so this is what it is. And in particular, the so-called space of directions of the orbit space, this one is what corresponds to the unit sphere in general. So the unit vectors in this sphere divide out by the isotropic group. So this is okay. Now this space is a lower dimensional space than the orbital manifold, right? And the, the definition of having boundary is, is given by induction of the vector. Okay. So when you say that a point is a boundary point if the space of directions at that point is boundary. Okay? And once you get down, you see either you have a boundary point or not. And uh, so if, if it is a boundary point, the space of directions has boundary. So you take such a point, it's a boundary point there. You go down dimension, 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 eventually get down to either an interval or a circle. And you know if it's boundary, it's an interval, and if it's a circle, it's not a boundary. So it's a somewhat involved uh, notion, maybe, for Alexander's space, but that's what it is. So I'd like to tell you what boundary points look like in an orbit space, because they are particularly simple. So let's take a point that's uh, made through the principal isotropic group. Okay? Let's, let's let K be an isotropic group <coughs> and next the smallest. Next smallest isotropic group. Okay? Now let's look at this picture again. Here's the orbit. Here's the slice. Questions? Well, I, I, don't, I still don't believe, even in the case when uh, the uh, connected component becomes not trivial, I don't believe this statement. So a, a typical counterexample would be if you looked at, uh, if you look at, a, at uh, if there's a there's a, a nice uh, way of thinking of R3 as opposed to R4 by a circle action. Right? So positive curvature. Positive curvature. Positive curvature is very important. It's a thermal blinking. It's not yeah. it's, 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 it's the positive thermal. curvature that makes it worse. Positive curvature. It's a thermal. So positive yeah. curvature here. Yeah. Non trivial thermal. Ah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, 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 now. So let's just think about so, so we take isotropic group K that's not principal, but it's the next smallest one. Okay? So what can you say? Now you look at the, the normal space, and first of all, you look at the fixed point set uh, of K. Of course, those corresponding orbits have isotropic K. Okay? Now you look at the space perpendicular to that inside the slice. Okay? So K acts on that, and since I just threw away all the ones that have isotropic group K, the only isotropic group left is the principal isotropic group. So on this sphere, in this space, the axiom acts with only one isotropy. So the orbit space is the metric. Right? So, and so if you look at the sphere here, so S fix uh, A curve mod K, oops, this to the orbit space. This is this is uh, a manifold now, with all one isotropic group with a fiber, namely uh, A1H. Right? 
Now, if you look at vibrations of spheres, they all know the velocity. And typically, let's, let's think about the case where this is not finite. Uh, then this is a hot vibration. Okay? And, um, and, uh, and this phase is like a projective space. So that's not a boundary point in this case. But there's one exceptional case. Namely, this group would act transitively on that speed. Also, right? So it acts with one isotropic group, but it could act transitively. So either it acts like this, then it's not a boundary point. But if it acts transitively, you see in this normal direction, all normal directions become one. And they are then perpendicular to this stratum. And that stratum becomes a boundary of the orbit space. Okay? And I call that a phase. So the boundary of an orbit space consists of closures of these things. It's very easy to see. So there's finitely many faces right, that make up the boundary. Now here's the beauty. If you look at the proof of the Sol theorem, you can easily adapt it to this orbit space situation. And what follows is that the distance function to a phase is okay. So this means you can repeat this process. You can look at the set of maximal distance. That's convex. This does, it does not have boundary. You can do it again. And eventually you end up with something without boundary. This doesn't have to be a manifold. It's maybe a single space. It doesn't have boundary. And it has the same homotopy type as the whole orbit space. Okay. This is for one phase. So this kind of shows that I don't even have to look at the whole boundary. Right? So in the case of manifold, the Sol theorem, you look at this convex set, and you look at the distance function. You have one Sol theorem. Here you have one Sol theorem for each phase. And you can take two phases, take the minimum of the two concave functions, another concave function, and you have a Sol theorem. So this becomes a very powerful tool, in particular if you have positive parameters. Because if you have positive parameters, then it is strictly positive. So then there's a unique point of maximum distance. And then the whole orbit space becomes a cone on that space. This, these are the, some of the important tools that go into the study of all these theories. So, um, so let me uh, return in the last 10 minutes to this uh, theorem. And say a little bit more about it and its proof. some magic here, and the magic is that these families, these two infinite families, have a different description. So the way we found them was in terms of cohomogeneity to one diagram, so these isotropic groups. Okay? Um, so maybe, um, let, let me just say what, uh, so these are seven dimensional examples, they're all seven dimensional examples. And the group G is a, a subgroup of S3 cross S3. Okay. So S3 cross S3 acts on all of them with call to each one. That makes sense. Right? This is a three limit, and the isochromic group is fine. Okay. And um, so there's some, the effective version is, in, in this case of PK, is an SO4. And the case of QK is an SO3 cross SO3. But in all cases, S3 plus S3 acts on it. And you don't really know that. So, uh, <coughs> so they have some diagram. Um,
Uh, let me just take the case of PK. And look at the case of PK. This is diagonal uh, Q of the, uh, so this is, Q is uh, plus minus one, plus minus i, plus minus j, plus minus i. And, and the, uh, the thing about the K is that, that tells you how this is embedded in here and how this is embedded in here. This is a function of K. Okay? So let me not say explicitly what it is. So there are lots of diagrams here that are described by many different ways of embedding circles in a C process. Right? That's how you get many examples. But it's a very particular list Now, so you can look at the, so in this example, like I said, either a three factor, <coughs> x almost three, on k. So you can look at the orbit space. Let's, for example, take the left as three. Okay. So this is an almost three x so I play. So this becomes a more default, at least more default method. Okay? So where you have finite isotropy, you get some similarity. So this is four dimensional. And it happens to be this force group. Okay? Now on this group, or on this space, the uh, induced action is uh, there's an S3 action, and the effective one is acting by SO3. And it's a well-known standard action of SO3 on the force sphere. So the, the picture on this force sphere is that two singular orbits are rb 2s of longitude. The chronometer 2 in the force sphere. And the, uh, the principal one is the SO3. And this is a particular class of example of these things. Now, the, the, in this situation, we have singularities on, the, on one of these orbits in the metric, and this normal angle is uh, its normal circle to, does not have length too high. And so the, in this case with K, the, the length is too high uh, divided by. This is the thing we have to do. So you see, when k is 1, which is the case of the 7th sphere, 2k minus 1 is, is 1, so it's 2 pi. There's no singularity. This is the standard 4 sphere, with the standard metric, and the map is the Hoffman. Okay? Now you do these other families, you start taking bigger k, and you get still the 4 sphere, and you get singularity along one of these orbits. Okay? Now for the 4 sphere, this is a standard metric. This is a self-dual Einstein metric. And the seventh sphere is actually a so-called three Sasaki metric that's associated with this self-dual Einstein metric. And it's the only smooth one, other than the one that comes from the complex predictor space. Okay? Now Hitchin proved years ago that each of these, with each of these singularities, there is an invariant metric relative to this action a self dual Einstein metric on that orbit. Okay? Whenever you have such a metric, there's a canonical bundle over it. It's the, it's the uh, principal bundle of the bundle of self dual two forms. That's an SO3 bundle. Okay? Now that bundle happens to be not simply connected, it has a two fold universal cover, which happens. So for all these, for all the odd ones here, when I take 2k minus 1, I get the pk's. If I take corresponding to the angles that are even here, I get the pk's. Okay. So, now here's the striking thing. So, so we realize that these metrics that are associated with three Sasaki bundles is exactly our list of metrics, which has the k. We also know that this is, uh, was 
to prove the structure by the theory product. In another situation, if you have something that is self to Einstein, and have a bundle over it, then you can take that three society metric and just scale the fibers, and eventually you get positive chromatin if you have positive chromatin. metrics on the base had positive curvature, there would be no more work to do. They would all have positive curvature for a very simple reason. Okay? Now, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, or I don't know, we've thought about it for so long that it's unfortunately done now. Maybe. <laughs> as soon as you pass one there, yeah, they do not have positive curvature. The okay? So this is no way. Now this three Sasaka metric on the total space is a connection metric. Okay? And uh, so our method here, and also Derekhart, by the way, Derekhart takes the Hitchin metric and deforms it with a conformal factor, uses the connection of the Hitchin metric, and claims to be a positive curve. The way we do it is, is uh, somewhat different. We look at the Hitchin metric, and then um, You divide the interval orbit space into, you find a way to divide it into three parts near the single orbits and away from it. And we construct, uh, so first of all, I should say that, uh, of course, if you have positive curves of, on the total space, of course you get positive curves in our game. It's the goal. Right? So if you don't have a metric of positive curves in our game, you get me. So we start with a metric down here, make sure it has positive curves, and then find a connection and claim it, prove that it has positive curves. Right. So the strategy is to find a C2 metric of positive curves. And the way it's done is to look at the Hitchin metric, look at the Hitchin connection, and in particular, change the Hitchin metric so that you get a metric on the base that has positive curves. This requires some concavity of the metric described by the Hitchin metric. And the Hitchin metric doesn't have this concavity. So you have to do that first, but then there are other delicate things you need to be involved in. Right? So our metric is an explicit polynomial metric of low degree in a neighborhood of, uh, of this endpoint, in a neighborhood of this endpoint, and then joined uniquely by a polynomial so that it's C2. So that's a metric on the base. The same thing with the connection. We also do it explicitly in terms of polynomials, actually with rational coefficients. So <coughs> construct a met polynomial metric on base. It's a polynomial business function or R. As a function of the, the parameter is the interval, the two orbit space. Right. So a metric is a dip like a distance function. If I call this, let's see, if we agree, I call this, this parameter right? t, if I call this parameter t, I have a polynomial as a function of t. What t do you have? This is this arc length. Arc length. Yeah. This, this, this yes, is this is function. Right. 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 True. Thank you. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that differs from, from working directly with Hitchin metric, because it's not given in arc length. It makes it very complicated. To translate it to arc length, you have to do numerical things. And that we're not able to do that. So, can you leave it to C2? I mean, you paste the polynomial to the higher order. Yes, yes. So, in the middle there, I have one. Right? No, but where you glue them? Can you, can you glue them so that they yes. the third order? Right. Can you so, carry out? Yes, so, so we get, so this, if, if this was one function, you have a, so you have a function here, you have a function there, you have a function there, and it's a C2 function. The polynomial here, the polynomial that they have same set of parameters. Presumably, it's computationally advantageous to make things below a low degree. Yes. Right. These polynomials are low degree. Right. Okay, so we do it for the, uh, for the metric on the base. It's described by three functions. Because think of it, at each, uh, at each point here, what is the orbit in this space? It's, uh, it's like in the space. Right? There's three directions. There's three killing fields. And they all perpendicular to one another. That's Force on it by what nice term it is. So you have to just specify the length of those kinetics. That's a metric of the base. Okay. 
Similarly, the connexin has the three functions also. So it's a total of six functions. And then the size of the fiber is, is constant. That's one constant. And we're going to shrink that to zero. Okay? So it's like, it's like six functions on the whole interval plus the constant for the fiber size. Okay? That describes the connexin. So the, uh, so the polynomial um, uh, connection also, and if you not choose, uh, well, we don't want to choose the Higgs connection, we stay close to the Higgs and now it's explicit in terms of polynomials, given in R okay. So once you have that, of course you can divide what the curvature formulas are, and they are very complicated. Okay. So you get now a curvature operator. Now, for the metric upstairs, on this seven metric On this seven metric floor, we have to look at the curvature operator on wedge two of R7 at any point. This is a 21 dimensional space. Right? Now, it so happens that uh, the curvature operator, when you look at it, again, by invariance of the group, so the isotropic group uh, restricts this axle here, and this actually four invariant subspaces. So there's a three by three invariant submatrix and uh, three six by six subspaces. So in other words, this, this space decomposed into a three dimensional space and a sum of three six dimensional spaces that are preserved by the curvature of the So you have to deal with uh, one three by three matrix and three six by six matrices. Well, you can do tricks to reuse this five by five but it even works without a group. And if you achieve a trick, it reduces to five by fives, three five by fives. But the point is that this curvature operator is quite complicated, and we want to analyze this curvature. And now what we do is we throw in the trick that's due to John Ford that was here at the So he analyzed four manifolds in terms of looking at the curvature operator and adding a four form to modify the curvature operator. You add a four form. You can think of a four form as uh, an operator on wedge two also. So if, if eta is a four form, then there's an operator on x wedge y, inner product uh, z wedge w is this eta on x y z w. So if you add that to a curvature operator and now compute what would it be the sectional curvature? The sectional curvature on a two plane, it looks like the two plane looks like x squared y, and then the inner product x squared y. That's a two plane span by x and y. Now when you, when you this is the sectional curvature of that two plane by definition. Right? Now you see that when you add this, it doesn't change anything. You get the same number. And in the midst of four, four actually showed that you can compute the maximum and the minimum of sex occurrences by the <coughs> You can find a four form that computes the maximum, the four form that computes the minimum. That doesn't work in general. But it's still true that if you can add a four form and you get the same sex occurrence. So what we do is we also find, and this is, this is a little trickier, of course, it has to do with the expressions that we have in this uh, three sasafi metric. We can add, we can Find, we find explicit four forms, also polynomial four forms, invariant four forms, so that when you add them to this, the new modified curvature operator becomes positive definite. Okay, so it's actually stronger than showing positive curvature. We find some modified operator that's positive definite. So in particular, that's positive curvature. And the way it's done, the way it's checked is that you look at these matrices, let's just take one of them. So you, you have to you have to add this so that it works for all of these matrices, all of these six by six matrices. And uh, so what you end up have to, what you have to check is we just use the Sylvester theorem. Just check that all these uh, diagonal, the determinants of all these diagonal things are all possible. Okay? Now, so how do you do that? Well, you have to do it for the polynomials that you looked at in this section. For the polynomials you looked at in this one, for the polynomials you looked at here, right? 
they all have rational coefficients. The curvature compresses, the curvature expresses it's clear they become rational functions. Okay. So these determinants are rational functions. <coughs> the coefficients that are rational. So at the end of the day, on each interval, we have to check that each of these rational functions is positive. The, the numerator is another problem. So the, well, the, sorry, the denominator is another problem. So the, the numerator is a polynomial. And you might as well scale it so it has each of the coefficients. Okay. So you now have a number of polynomials, all with each of the coefficients. And what you have to check is that they are positive at one point, that's easy, and then that they have no real zeros. Then they must be positive. And there's an algorithm for that that's due to school. So when we apply that algorithm, this is actually using the Euclidean algorithm for a polynomial and its derivative, finding the greatest common divisor. We look at that algorithm of school that tells you exactly how many zeros you have in a given Okay? So we use that algorithm and we with our functions we see, oh, there are no zeros. Remember. Thank <laughs> you. 